I'm Barry Kibrick, and I want to thank all of you who have been tuning into our show via YouTube. As a staple on PBS, I'm so grateful that you can now see our full episodes online. I hope you're enjoying them, and please subscribe to our channel so I can continue to make them available to all. Thank you. We all possess some form of creativity, and no one understands that on a deeper level than my guest, the world-renowned psychologist and author, Dennis Palumbo. Writer of the film My Favorite Year and the groundbreaking book Writing from the Inside Out, our conversation today focuses on two very diverse topics, his latest mystery, Phantom Limb, and his insights on psychology, the media, and its effect on all of us. Dennis, it's always a pleasure to have you on Between the Lines. Thank you, my friend, for joining us again. It's a pleasure to be here, Barry, as always. Well, I wanted to start with this thing that I told you just in the green room before. I was only going to discuss Phantom Limb, and yesterday or the day before, you, I saw the link in Psychology Today, and you have an entire article on, on two subjects, actually. It's how the media portrays psychologists in film and in television and in all sorts of ways, and even the trap that psychologists get into in regards to labeling. Right. And you even, uh, we won't get into any of the politics of it, but even the labeling has a, an effect not only in the psychological profession, but that then translates into the labeling that is dividing people. That's right. That's exactly right. I think as humans, we have a tendency to label anyway. And so, I mean, for example, there are many people for whom, oh, the kid who's, you know, not as ambitious as everyone wants will go, oh, he's so lazy, you know, or a couple that doesn't want to have children, you know, they're selfish. They're not having children. In the psychological realm, ever since the, you know, in the last, I'd say, I don't know, 100 years or so, the, the clinical profession has had a manual called the Diagnostic Manual, and every couple years they get together, therapists, psychiatrists, clinicians of all types, and neuropsychologists, and they create psychiatric labels. And now because of the media, we all know them. Everybody knows what bipolar is. Everybody knows what schizophrenic is. Everybody knows what Asperger's is. In fact, if anything, I'm beginning to hear people in regular conversation go, oh, He's so on the spectrum. And these are people who don't know what they're talking I about. I just was going to say. <laughs> but more importantly, there's a real temptation when you're a clinician to categorize people by their labels. I remember being at a conference one time and a therapist said, you know, my practice isn't bad. I've got uh, two bipolars, uh, two major depressive, and thank God, only one borderline. And see, I'm concerned when clinicians use labels as a way to distance themselves from their experience of a patient and seeing the patient as an individual human being. Wow, let's now then go to the individual human being in phantom limb. I was gonna start the introduction by saying, you know, the, what is that old, uh, J.D., uh, P.D., P.D. James mm -hmm. from, from Britain uh, who wrote mysteries and she said, you know, every autobiography, I'm paraphrasing it now, is fiction, and every fiction has a lot of autobiography. So we talk about clinicians yeah. and the media. That's why I thought this would tie together. We have a psychologist who's writing about a psychologist in Phantom Limb. And the first, though, thing that caught my eye were these three words, broken in spirit. And I couldn't help, but as I finished the book, realized that one, everyone virtually in the book is some form broken in spirit. Mm -hmm. And I looked down at my notes and as I wrote it, I said, oh my gosh, every human being is somewhat broken in spirit. Now, some less, some more, depending on where the spectrum yeah. you fall, but that's the truth, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the Buddhists say that, you know, all life is suffering. They don't mean necessarily like being, you know, uh, uh, in agony, 
but rather that life is something that has to be borne up under, that we all have existential pain, things that hurt us, that reveal our vulnerabilities to us, and I think that that's the way in which we're all broken. The good news is we're all broken, so we can have something to share with each other. And I think that that's the thing that makes doing work with people, whether as a therapist or as a friend or writing about people, so powerful. It's like what Martin Buber talked about when he talks about I and thou, that thing that happens between two people. And if two broken people, by which I mean two human beings, share their experience with each other, that experience by being common allows both of them to feel solace. If you think about the, in my opinion, the most powerful aspect of being in psychological therapy is the feeling of being deeply understood. If we're deeply understood and found to be okay and still lovable and worthwhile, then how we're vulnerable, how we're broken, doesn't matter at all. Well, you know, in Phantom Limb, you use these words. People, in fact, I think this is also from Martin Buber. I think this is what you, you, you quoted him. People need to be heard, not answered. Yes. That's the key, isn't it? To be listened to, not giving you an answer necessarily. And by the way, if anyone falls into the wrong part of that trap, it's me. I've got answers for everything. <laughs> but I, 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 I do appreciate the knowledge that, you know, listen. Just listen. Mm -hmm. It was Martin Buber, and the reality is we understand and comprehend others better by listening than by telling them who you are, who we are, what we think is going on. Those words often, you know, it's the thing Harold Pinter said, we use words to disguise our nakedness. And the reality is if we can just be present with someone, in their pain, in their joy, in their sorrow, and they can feel deeply understood, deeply heard, and have the sense that all of their feelings are welcomed by you. That's the best thing you can do for a person. Well, there, that, is that not by definition the true word empathy? It is as far as I'm concerned. I think a lot of times people think Empathy means, well, you make an intellectual interpretation. And this brings us back to labeling, by the way, where I'll listen, let's say I listen to you for five minutes. I can't listen to you if I'm thinking to myself, hmm, bipolar with mixed emotional features, perhaps adjustment disorder, um, hmm, I see some schizotypical issues there. I'm not listening to you. I'm going through a card catalog in my head of everything I learned in graduate school. And I really have come to believe after being a therapist for almost 27 years that the more a therapist hides behind labels, the less he or she is actually available to his or her patient. You tell in that article, and I want to get back to the book as well, but you tell in that article that little joke where the psychologists were talking and one, oh, wait, you, you do it better than I will, but about the guy who arrives early, oh, he yeah. gets to say it. Well, it's, let him, it's, let, it's classic. Just, it's, classic. It, it, it's the classic therapeutic conundrum. If the patient arrives early, he's anxious. If he arrives late for his appointment, he's resistant. And if he's on time, he's compulsive. <laughs> so we got you coming and going. Yeah. Well, let's go back, though, mm -hmm. to the psychologist in here, Daniel Rinaldi. Uh, right. Now, it's the, is this the third in the series? This is the fourth book, the fourth in, the book in the series. And these words come out. I believe we make our own luck in life. And when I read that, I, I took the word luck and expanded it. I have to admit that I, I believe there is also, without taking blame, there's this fine balance between not being a victim, by taking responsibility, and by doing so, is luck the residue of that design? I do believe that the golfer Ben Hogan was right, which is that the harder you work, the luckier you get. 
And I think that if you work and strive hard for some goal, including self-understanding, you, I think, generate a kind of atmosphere in which luck tends to go your way. But that's very different from people who think, well, if I just fantasize about being a millionaire, I'll be a millionaire. I, that stuff to me is incomprehensible. But what I mean by it is to do what you need to do, to work as hard as you can to do it. And in my experience, if you're not too attached to the outcome, luck tends to come your way. But that's it, the attachment to the outcome. How, wait a minute, this, we, I said I wasn't gonna get into a therapy session with you, Sorry. Dennis, but, but <clears throat> how does one, it seems almost, I, I, and I'm so aware of it, but yet so, it seems almost impossible to separate that in my mind. The outcome is always sitting there. I could understand completely what you mean. Deeply in mm -hmm. my soul I can feel it, but yet it's not gonna leave. It's very, very difficult. I'm doing it right now. A part of me is trying to be present with you, and another part of me is going. I hope the interview is going well. Oh, so it I'm is, there, don't I'm, worry. Well, no, but the point <laughs> is is that it's, it's really endemic in us. And I think one of the, the, the best ways to deal with that is to try to stay in the present. When I work with writer patients in my practice, my goal for them is not that they'll finish a book or a script and it'll be great. My goal for them is to cherish the experience of writing it. Because you spend most of your time in your experience of doing something. And I think if you get too caught up in the result, then you end up spending most of your time thinking about attaining that goal, which we only do 2% of the time in our life. We spend most of our life in process. We're in process right now, you and I. And as long as I can stay present, then I'm in reality. When I start saying, gee, I hope this interview's going well, or I think the last time I was on the show I was better, I'm out of the present. I'm not in what Buber calls I and thou, but I'm in my head. And as the Buddhists say, the thinking mind is a wonderful servant and a terrible master. Oh, I'm telling you, I'd like to just donate my head to science sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I'm going to take you back to your own book because okay. I'll tell you why. You talked about the present and being in the present. And there's something you do in the book that I believe gets the characters always back to that moment. Isn't this interesting? The place itself, Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. the location seems to play a role in the lives of the people. And I, I, I mean that on, on the deep level that we're talking about, as if the location, whether it was the, a certain bar in Pittsburgh they, the detectives liked to hang out at, whether it, there was a sense that when they were there, they were in the moment. So location, in a weird way, sometimes does set the moment. Of course it does. If you, first of all, I appreciate your understanding that Pittsburgh's actually a character in my novels. The, the city itself, the, oh, way yeah. it, the way it's changed, and also the way the people in Pittsburgh inform the town and the town informs the people. In other words, what we're really talking about when we talk about location is we're talking about context. What's the context of our lives? Where we live, the choices we make, the friends that we choose, the work that we decide to do. This is the context, some of which comes to us, some of which we create by choices we make. And those two things together create the context in which our personal narratives happen. Well, then I want to specifically ask you about this particular context of what you wrote because it almost didn't sound like it would come from a psychologist, and yet when I read it three or four times, I'm thinking maybe there's something there and we're going to see. These are the words. It's not the despair that kills you. It's the hope. Right. I was quoting someone who had said that one time. And what I liked about that is that it helps for our, my hero, Daniel Rinaldi, 
to understand and empathize with people who are despairing and to help them be reasonable about their hope. I think as long as we are okay with ourselves and our feelings, we can sit with, with despair, with sadness, with grief. I think if we say to ourselves, yeah, but I, if I win the lottery, then everything will be fine. The idea that some hoped for event will take us out of the circumstances we're in. And in my experience, in my practice and in my life, is when you get too invested in that hoped for goal, the disappointment if it doesn't happen is much more shattering than the, the sadness or despair you may be feeling about an incident or experience that will pass, it will move through you. Well, it just came to me, in a sense, Hope is one of the things described like that. I'm not talking about, you know, faith or the other type of hope there is, but described like that is one of the key things that would take you out of the present moment. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We have to be careful that we don't have some idea that there will be some event which includes our own growth. I mean, one of the things that I'm always struck by when people come to therapy is their idea that there's some perfectible version of themselves in the future that will be untroubled by sadness, grief, anger, upsetness, as though there's a perfectible version of them that will be happy. And I think it depends, you know, it's sort of like if I take the right pill, if I get the right car, if I, you know, make enough money, if I get the right therapist. These are all ways to say that who I am right now in this moment is not enough. And if there's one thing I believe is that you are enough, just sitting there, right there, you are enough. Well, you take that even further in Phantom Limb. I'll read this line to you. There are times when being considered indispensable is more of a burden than a compliment. Now, isn't that an extension of just that? Because if you're so concentrating on what, makes you great, what's going to make you the guy that they can't get rid of, what's going to do all of that, that is a burden. Even though someone would want to say, boy, you're indispensable. Mm -hmm. Well, that sounds like a compliment. So that's an interesting yeah, the duality there. Yeah, I think it, it's important because, number one, as a therapist, you don't want to see yourself as indispensable because that's a self-concept that creates a wall between you and your own experience, let alone the experience you have with your patient. What I think is indispensable is connection between people, is communication, is empathy. That's what I think, the, the sort of intersubjective experience of, of, of being in the moment with another person. To create that together is an indispensable thing. Well, you even in fact, it's funny, we go back to the labeling because this is from, the, as you call it, the humane wisdom of a paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> but he says, life kicks the blank out of people. And that's what we're talking about. No matter what, life is going to kick you. So what you're going to have to do is not prevent it from kicking you. From what I'm gathering, it is simply, how are you going to respond to that's that right. kick? The, the quote comes from a character in the book, Noah Fry, who's a paranoid schizophrenic and a friend of, of my lead character. And what you're getting at, and, uh, and, and I think this is really important, is what's the meaning you give to a painful event that happens? If you give it the meaning of, well, if I had been smarter or had more foresight, this wouldn't have happened, so it's kind of my fault that it happened. Or if you give it the meaning that, oh, I'm the kind of guy to whom these things always happen. These meanings are created in our head. They're just abstract ideas about ourselves. And I think it's very hard to be self-loving and appropriately self-reflective if you think that every feeling you have or everything that's happened to you is a referendum on you. Dennis, you're your wisdom, your insight, I, I'm go because of it, I have another quote I found. And it's very funny because I don't want to, to let people know. Phantom Limb, 
it's not as heavy as I'm making it. It's yeah, a great I was, book. I, I know. I, 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 I was be thinking careful. to myself, do people understand this is a mystery <laughs> this thriller? This is. It is. It's a mystery <laughs> thriller. It's a great read on the beach. I mean, you don't have, but I can't help it. There's certain things that I guess you have you put in there, and and they just they grab my attention. Well, this when is you one have of, a when you have a psychologist write a mystery thriller, unfortunately, that's some of the baggage that comes with. It. <laughs> but it's not baggage. It's it's what makes it to me makes the conversation great. Holding either barely contained madness or profound knowledge of the infinite or both. Now, I'm taking it completely out of context, but there is something about madness in a way and knowledge and the infinite that does need deeper exploration. I was telling even my son, uh, the other day, and I said, you know, I, I have my own little theories I make up, and one of them is about schizophrenia. And I say, you know, we all deal with frequencies in life. There's frequencies. What would have happened if that schizophrenic really is picking up something, and we're calling him just an idiot? How do we know? Well, I'm looking at this, <coughs> and I'm saying, where is madness? Where is knowledge? Where is the infinite? They're all concepts. They're all held in our heads at the same time. I don't want to sound like that newscaster, but what's the frequency, Dennis? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the thing. The, the quote is, is about Noah Fry, and that depending on whether you know him or not or how you feel about him, the glint in his eye either seems like madness or he has a window into the infinite. Interestingly enough, there are many native peoples and indigenous cultures for whom schizophrenics are considered wisdom figures. And when I worked at the psychiatric hospital, there, uh, when I first came there, people used to say to me, oh, schizophrenics, they see and hear things that aren't there, right? And as I worked with my patients, I began to see, no, schizophrenics are people who he and hear and see things that I don't hear and see. And that's as far as I'm going to go. Yeah. I, I really think that we, there's so many aspects have you as as a psychologist you must see this often but there's so many aspects of our own selves that go unexplored we you know and and, and listen we it goes all the way back to socrates the unexplored mind the mm -hmm. un, we know the importance of it since the beginning of the first philosophies we've developed and yet we're afraid to is it fear maybe it is fear the, to me, the goal of therapy is self-acceptance, to understand that to the extent you understand yourself, to the extent you can be self-reflective, you want to do it. But you also, there's a part of each human being that's mysterious. And I think there's just a limit to self-knowledge. Even if you begin to tell yourself, oh, I know why I did that, it's because my mother said this when I was a kid. Or I did that because my dad used to treat me like this when I was a kid. You want to be very careful that you don't create the illusion that everything is structural and that everything can be reduced to a finite cause. That's the scientific principle. It's very reductionist. I think people are more complicated than that. I think there's an unknowing that's part of all of us. And it's more important to be self-accepting than to have some sort of fantasized, glittering, exquisitely attuned knowledge of yourself such that there's not a spontaneous moment in your life. Self-acceptance is one of the themes I always have for this show because I always found this to be interesting, where we always talk about forgiveness. I've always found that people who were on the spectrum of lousy, they didn't have as much trouble with this <laughs> as the people who are on the spectrum of good. And that is, it's one thing to forgive others. Mm -hmm. I find that fairly easy. Where I think we do have this struggle is in forgiving ourselves. That's exactly right. Depending on the dynamics of our childhood, it can be very hard, particularly if you're shame prone or were very uh, harshly criticized when you were young, to feel comfortable forgiving yourself. And it's interesting you said that point about um, 
the, the lousy guys don't worry about that. There's certain people I can think of or there are people in the media where I go, I bet they don't have a moment's doubt about themselves, you know? And I always think of that wonderful quote from Bertrand Russell. He said, the problem with the world is that the stupid are cocksure and the intelligent are full of doubt. Oh, that is beautiful. On that note, Dennis, as always, the honor and pleasure. Oh my gosh, thanks for having mine. me. It's mine, thank you my friend so much. Thank you for joining us. Now before Dennis leaves, I would like to leave you with these words from Dennis's latest Rinaldi mystery phantom limb. Love can sometimes hide unbiden and unspoken in the fissures of the most fractured, the most damaged of relationships. I'm Barry Kibrick. It is often between the fissures of life that we not only find love, but wisdom as well. So. To connect with Barry, like him on Facebook and follow him on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, view past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his weekly blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick is made possible in part by Sam Ash Music, a proud sponsor of Between the Lines with Barry Kibrick. Sam Ash has been serving musicians since 1924. To unlock your inner musician, information is available at samash.com. <laughs>